said many times, I moved to Chicago to go to college or to the Chicagoland area. And when I arrived there in the mid-1980s, the most beloved athlete in that city was the second baseman of the Chicago Cubs, Ryan Sandberg, who joins me on the Goodyear Hotline. Good morning, Ryan. It's a pleasure. Thanks for doing this. Greeny, you bet. Nice to be with you. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you. I, well, you just heard that there, and that that's the call of the legendary Sandberg game that sort of made you a, a legendary figure. 84, you win the MVP. My favorite stat, Hembo and I were just going over stats. You had 19 triples in, 19, in 1984. Is there, did they have 19 triples in the sport this year with every <laughs> player combined? Like, when you look back yeah. on that now, Reiner, does it seem like you were playing a different game than they play today? Well, you know what? Uh, speed was one of my main assets in all of my sports, whether it was football, basketball, or baseball. And when I was kind of coming up through the minor leagues, I was actually coached to stay on top of the baseball, put the ball in play, hit a few gappers, and then my run, my my running speed and, and foot speed would take over. I actually had quite a few doubles and triples actually in the minor leagues coming up. So uh, there in 84, um, I, I believe I actually had two or three triples to left center field at Wrigley Field, if you can imagine that, you know, being mm. so short out there and then the short throw to third base. I do recall that. But it, um, just being a gap type hitter and using the whole field, I, I'd slice some balls down the right field line. I'd hit some balls into right center uh, and, and things like that. And the triples just added up that year along with the 19 home runs. So at one point late in the season there in 84, I believe I needed one home run and one triple to uh, be, it might've been the first player to have 20 or more in all the categories. And uh, in the clinching game in Pittsburgh, I had three doubles in that game. Larry McWilliams was pitching. I hit three balls down on the left field corner over the bag. Rick Sutcliffe was pitching. We we're getting ready to clinch. One of those doubles, there was no outs. And I stopped at second base just because there was no outs. And I was, I knew I'd done my job already. You don't want to make the first out at third base, especially in a clinching game, and especially for the Cubs that hadn't been to postseason. So I pulled up there, and I end up scoring. Gary Matthews knocked me in, but I get back to the dugout or after the game. They said, you should have went for the triple right there. <laughs> and I said, no, I couldn't have been thrown out right there, and Cubs do not go to the playoffs. <laughs> Uh, listen, I mean, it, no one played the game the right way, the way you did. You talked about it on the Hall of Fame speech, and that's a perfect example of it. You know, I, I missed that year by one year. So I came to Chicago in 85 to go to college. And, and so I was there for the 89 season when you guys won the division and a lot of your career. But that 84 team, because I'm now married to a Chicago girl and I'm surrounded by so many Cubs fans in my life. The love affair that that city had for that team. When you think back on that year, the, the, the way that city loved the 84 Cubs is something that has been tangible to me. I've, I've noticed it in conversations with people. How do you describe it? No question about it. I hear it on a daily basis, even today. But what had happened was, um, you know, at the end of spring training, Gary Matthews and Bob Dernier come over from the Phillies. Uh, Dallas Green's the GM. Jim Fry's the new manager. And things were clicking in June and uh, all of a sudden, Dallas Green gets the okay from the Tribune Company, brings in Rick Sutcliffe, Dennis Eckersley, Ron Hasse, made some deals. And now we got two pitchers to add to that. And then from that point on, and then the Sandberg game, June 23rd, and then the All-Star break. I don't think you could get a, a ticket the rest of the year after the All-Star break. And we, I hadn't seen that. I was there in 82, 83. And if it wasn't the weekend games, um, you know, you could get you could get a ticket right up uh, the day of the game and, and sit 20 rows up. So I saw the change of that. I also saw the change of uh, seeing fans now getting up on top of the rooftops because they could not mm -hmm. no longer get a ticket and now watch mm -hmm. the game from up on the rooftops just in folding chairs and a sometimes a, a, a hibachi grill up there with some smoke going <laughs> and six guys. That was the start of the rooftops that I that I recalled and. Uh, and the other big difference was uh, just traveling coast to coast. First of all, 162 games that year, uh, Harry Carey and Steve Stone, nationally televised game, day game, 120 starts. Everybody was watching. Now we pull up on our buses at the hotel, and the first time in my career, there's Cub fans waiting for us there at 2 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, New York, Montreal, Houston. It didn't matter where. The Cub fans were now there with their gear out, and we were knocking at the door for first place, headed to the playoffs. So the fans were coming out of the woodwork. 
all of a sudden. And is that built uh, th through the second half of the season and into September? Uh, it, that just increased and increased, and the buzz around Wrigley Field was off the charts. All of a sudden in my career, and now I'm doing uh, 10 o'clock news where the sports comes on at 1020, and hmm. I'm staying up later than my bedtime for the day games just to appease <laughs> the media and to get me at home. Here's home with Ryan Sandberg, and here I am talking about the game and the team. And, you know, they by the time they leave, it's 11, 11, 15, at way over my bedtime for a day game. And so that was another thing that uh, was a big change for me. And um, I al also, uh, the second half of the season, the the head of the media came up to me and said, hey, Ryan, we need to have a little five-minute thing with you, session with you over in the dugout here. The, the, the media would like to get one-on-one -on -one with you. That was a new thing back then, having like a, a, a pregame media thing for me and for a player. That actually was the first season the Cubs drew more than 2 million fans to Wrigley Field. And so it was a love affair, and it was a terrific team and, and, and a terrific season. The great Ryan Sandberg is with me. You know, you mentioned Harry Carey, and I have frequently said that when I came to Chicago, I didn't know a soul, and I discovered that the Cubs played on Channel 9 and that they had <laughs> – every game was in the afternoon. There were no lights at Wrigley Field yet, and that this announcer, right. Harry Carey, was the, was the single greatest thing that ever happened. I have jokingly said he was my first <laughs> friend in Chicago, even though I never met him. When people ask you for, for your favorite Harry Carey memory, what is it? What do you say is your, is your most uh, vivid memory of Harry? Uh, you know, uh, as a player, I started to really appreciate, appreciate him, not because he mispronounced names and things like that, which uh, <laughs> myself and the opposing team would get a kick out of uh, talking about it at second base or, or pregame, whatever. But um, when I'd be taking batting practice home and or on the road, you know, it's an hour and a half before the game, whatever, I'd be I'd, I'd be going up. It's my group to hit. I'd, I'd stand there be beforehand, sign some autographs for the fans. Oftentimes... All of a sudden, Harry would become walking down the aisle over here just to say hi or to the and just be around the batting cage or whatever. All of a sudden, somebody would spot him and say, "Hey, there's Harry!" And <laughs> here goes all the fans leave me and they go over and run over <laughs> to Harry Carey. And I was allowed to go up and take my batting practice and get ready for the game. And and that's the influence that he had. He was a celebrity. He was an icon. He was that type of a figure. And uh, and he the same thing getting off a, a plane at a hotel very similar type of a thing but he was a uh, people from across the country were watching him uh, WGN no doubt helped me uh, with my preparation for a game knowing that the whole country was watching every single game uh, people from up where I came from Spokane Washington relatives friends people across the country were watching our game I knew that. And the first thing about that was the first All-Star game I went to was in 84. Um, so there's batting practice day before the game. I take two steps out on the, uh, the out of the locker room at um, old uh, Candlestick Park in San Francisco. Long walk down there from there to the dugout. I get halfway down there. An American League bat boy comes sprinting up to me. Hey, Mr. Sandberg, uh, if you have a minute, George Brett wants to get his picture with you. You're his favorite mm. player. Ooh. So uh, I, I have that picture, and, of course, I idolized George Brett at that time. He was uh, years ahead of me, but I posed for that picture. I have it, and he said, Rhino, I watch you guys every day before I go to the ballpark. I get to the ballpark. I check in and see how you guys are doing. You're having a great year. You know, keep it going. That's a great story. It, it's such a unique it, circumstance, Be, being that the, the superstation and all that kind of stuff. It was just so different. And Harry being the mayor of Rush Street and all the rest of that, Greeny and the great Ryan Sandberg is with me here. I wasn't going to ask you this, but you made me think of it. Growing up in Washington, as you did, who was your favorite player? Who did you, because you love the game so much. Who was the player you grew up idolizing? Uh, first of all, I was a three-sport athlete. I liked, I loved whoever was on TV. So in playing football and playing football in the front yard, I liked Robin Gabriel of the mm -hmm. Rams, a quarterback. Mm -hmm. I was a quarterback, you know, Nerf football and the plastic football play out there. I was him. Um, I was John Havlicek or, uh, or Walt Frazier basketball playing out in the backyard uh, for baseball. For me, it was uh, Pete Rose and the big red machine. Mm -hmm. uh, Saturday game of the week was the only game that I would see one nationally game or one MLB game. 
uh, a week, and it was the Saturday games of the week. And through the early 70s there, mid-70s, of course, the Big Red Machine was on the games of the week a lot. But I like Pete Rose's approach to the game, his hustle, uh, his using the whole field. Uh, I emulated uh, emulated him out in the front yard with wiffle ball, right-handed, left-handed hitter, and I'd mix it up. Uh, but I emulated him. But I, I loved his hustle, and uh, even on a base on ball, sprinting down to first base. I loved the way he played the game. The great Ron Sandberg is with me. Something that I know everyone knew at the time, but I don't know how many people listening to this conversation know. You were recruited to Washington State to play quarterback. So you were that good. How close did you come to being a football player rather than a baseball player? Uh, during my uh, After my football season, my senior year, uh, now I was playing basketball, averaging uh, 19.5 points a game, by the way, all-state <laughs> basketball player. <laughs> um, now I was taking trips to the colleges for football because I was a Parade Magazine All-American quarterback, uh, so recognized nationally. But I took trips to uh, Oklahoma and uh, uh, Nebraska and Oregon's and UCLA and both Washington's and Arizona State. Uh, I actually saw that and then there was a date where you needed to sign and you could be like left alone type of a thing. I signed a letter of intent to go to Washington State. Uh, Jack Thompson, the throwing Samoan, would have been a senior that next year. I'd have been a freshman. The, I think the idea was for me to step in after him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had my classes picked out. I had a roommate. I was all good to go. I played. Uh, I, I still had baseball in the back of my mind at Washington State as a second sport and try and keep up the studies, by the way, which was, uh, which was my mind was spinning pretty quickly there. How I was going to do that. But. Uh, I played about a month of American Legion baseball and all of a sudden the June draft comes and I was drafted by the Phillies and I wanted to be a, a professional player, sports player and athlete and, and just a conversation with my older brother, six years older, Dell, um, came to the conclusion, sign now with the Phillies, be a professional player, work your way up and uh, forget about the studies and and trying to survive uh, college football, let alone get to the uh, uh, the pros as a football player. Mm -hmm. The great Ryan Sandberg is with me. If I'm slightly distracted, it is because as I'm looking at your at the shot that we have of you, I'm trying to count the number of gold gloves you have in that trophy behind uh, trophy case behind you. H how many gold gloves are in that hembo? He won nine, <laughs> plus won seven nine. silver sluggers, uh, and all the silver. Uh, you're, you have. There you go. I'll give you good luck. That is quite a trophy case <laughs> that you have. You mean the big those, wall? For those listening on the radio, he's, he's got the trophy case behind him, and I can see all the gold gloves on one side and, and the silver yeah. sluggers on the other. Let me ask you one more thing here because I'm going to run out of time. I could do this for 20 hours. But, but, but in all kidding aside, because you guys came so close in 84, and I, I know the heartbreak that so many of the fans felt and that you guys did. You know, when the Cubs finally break through and win it in 16, and I know how happy you were for that. I was around you a little bit during that. You were a big part yeah. of it, and the fans loved having you be a part of it. But when you look back on it, how do you – like, where the fact that you guys never won, that you never won a championship, you're a Hall of Famer, you're one of the greatest players of all time, the game made you, you know, things beyond your wildest imagination. I know how appreciative you were of that. But how does it make you feel, the fact that you, you never won the whole thing as a Cub? Uh, yeah, I still think about that quite a bit because that was an experience that I had. That was an experience that my teammates and our, that was our goals. That was our man, my manager's goals, my coaches. Uh, that's a goal is to play, you know, when I'm playing in the front yard, I was talking about, it was about being in a world series and winning world series. So yeah, that still hurts. And I think about that a lot. Uh, the 84 team was probably the best shot to get there. Short five game series with three games, uh, Sweat sweep in in uh, San Diego after we uh, handled them pretty good at, at Wrigley Field. Uh, you know that was a feeling and a, and a thought that uh, really it, it never left me. It probably never will. 2016 really helped being an ambassador, being around, doing some radio, some post game TV like that. Being a part of the team from start to finish in 16 was gratifying. Uh, the Cubs were nice enough to give me a, a World Series ring as a uh, as with the retired number and a Hall of Famer. Uh, but still, yeah, I, I think about it a lot. It was always a, it was always a dream of mine to play in a World Series, win a World Series, no doubt.
Can't blame Ryan, although it didn't happen. Hit 385 in the playoffs in his career. Ryan Sandberg, it is such a pleasure to catch up. Thank you so much for taking this time. Legends Week would not be uh, would not be filled without you. The best of the family, and I hope that I will see you soon. Thanks very much. Thanks, Rainey. Yeah, have a good one.